today I, I really felt the Lord just wanted to bring hope and encouragement. Hope in particular. Um, I just, as I was praying and, and meditating, I just could not escape um, thinking about hope. And so I want to I want to bear my heart a bit this morning, if that's okay. Um, I want to share a, a testimony later on um, that will sort of help uh, release the word that, that God is bringing to to bring hope in different areas of our life. Now, in in the world, if somebody says, "I hope that this is going to happen," or "I hope." The Crows are going to win the grand final, or I hope Port Power are going to win the grand final, or I hope Hawthorne's going to win the, the grand final. Whichever team that you barrack for, hope in the world is only a maybe. It's, not a, it's, it's all it is. It's a possibility of something going to happen. And somehow I think that definition has crept into our minds when we think of hope that comes from God. But think of this, it says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. May the God of hope, he is the initiator of true hope. And the actual definition of hope is to anticipate or to expect. I was woken up some years ago with, with a phrase, the certainty of hope. The certainty of, of biblical hope. The certainty of hope that God puts it into our hearts. It's not a maybe. It's, it's a definite. It's something that will happen. And it's something in the future. You could probably put it this way. It's a... Uh, A certain joyful expectation of God fulfilling every word that he has spoken. So if we look historically back through the Bible, has any one of his promises failed? Nothing. So when it talks about the God of hope, when he speaks something, he knows that it's going to happen. There is there's no uncertainty whatsoever. And that is the same hope that he wants us to constantly have in our heart. In 1 Peter it says, praise. There's that word again, praise. Today we were talk, we're talking about praise. Everywhere you look, we're exhorted to praise. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus. In his great mercy... He has given us new birth into a living hope. A living hope through the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. Kept in heaven for us who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last day. We are getting closer to that. I know we're the, you have to say historically, we're, we're the generation that's closest to that because we are, but we know that certain things are happening in the earth that are being fulfilled, prophecies that have been spoken of about Israel that have happened in the 70 years that they've been in their land, and in particular when they first came back into the land, can a nation be born in, in one day? And they were in one day. And they, it's, uh, it's going to be 70 years in May. Is that right, Colin? 14th of May this year. It will be 70 years exactly from the time that they became a nation again. There are many prophecies that have been fulfilled from that or before that time and from that time. And we are getting closer to the return of Jesus. So all the more reason why he wants us to have a living hope. So that is a living anticipation and expectation of the Lord's return 
an anticipation of every prophecy that he's given being fulfilled. One of those which uh, different prophets have um, talked about is Damascus. There, are, I can't remember where the scripture is, but there's a scripture relating to Damascus where it's just going to be no more. It will be leveled. And you see there's a lot of fighting that's going on in Syria at the moment in Damascus and around Damascus. So when that happens, when Damascus doesn't exist anymore, you know that's a fulfillment of prophecy that is getting us very close to the return of, of Jesus. And there are many other prophecies that um, have been expounded and been fulfilled in this time. So all the more reason why he wants us to have a living, joyful expectation of seeing the Lord's return, because it will happen, it's going to happen. It says in um, 2 Peter that um, the earth is going to be destroyed by fire. Actually, I'll read it. It says, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. And since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. So that word is going to be fulfilled. So we have a hope, a certainty, God's hope, that that word will be fulfilled. And what were we asked to do? We ought to live holy and godly lives. Couldn't help but think of that scripture in Hebrews where it says, um, while Jesus lived on the earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. We are the hands and the feet of Jesus. While we are on the earth, if we're to live holy and godly lives, we're to live lives that he typified. So our prayers are going to count. We offer up our prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who can fulfill his word on the earth. And that's, that's what he wants, us to continually be praying as watchmen for his words to be fulfilled, to hasten, like it said there, to hasten the return of the Lord. So we can, we can actually... Um, be involved in the speeding up of the return of Jesus through our prayers, through our cries and our petitions. So don't be afraid to, to really cry out to the Lord in this time. Know what his word says and petition him. Petition means taking his word and asking him to fulfill it. So he's given us that living hope, living expectation. And you can see that faith, hope, and love work together. You, know, you, you read through the scriptures, you'll find they're hardly separable. They're somewhere close to one another there. And my interpretation is that hope is activated through faith and it's expressed with love. So as we know that there's a certainty about those words being fulfilled, and we have that hope then it says the love of God lives richly in our hearts. So it says to love one another deeply and express the love of God to those around us, those who haven't had that opportunity for salvation. And so we express the hope that we have in us, the certainty of things being fulfilled by loving people, loving one another and loving the lost. So we literally love them into the kingdom. Because we know his words are going to be fulfilled. Jesus said that this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in every nation and then the end will come. That's one of the last signs. So we can pray that he, that, that word would be fulfilled here in Australia and that we would, 
actually be um, the ones that he uses to fulfill that word. And that's why, that's why we're crying out for more of the Holy Spirit. That's why I was asking you know, for a desperation for the Holy Spirit to be activated in a greater way in our lives so that we demonstrate the kingdom of heaven in the same way that Jesus demonstrated. And we are seeing glimpses of it. You get on YouTube, you can, you can see many people that are, are walking in the power of the Holy Spirit and seeing miracles happen. So if you want to encourage yourself to build your faith to see more happening here, get onto YouTube and, and look up the miracles. Make sure you go to, to people that have a, a good standing, good creditation, um, and you'll soon find out who they are. You'll open your heart to discernment. But that, they're the sort of things that will build our faith to see us actually do those things in greater measure. The God of hope can, can only be the God of certainty and expectation. There can't be any other definition. It has to happen. And he says to us in Jeremiah, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. There are scriptures to do with praise, Time doesn't permit me to go through a lot of these. Psalm 71 in particular says, For you have been my hope, sovereign Lord, my confidence since my youth. From birth I've relied on you. You brought me forth from my mother's womb. I will ever praise you. Think of that song, Your praise will ever be on my lips. Most of you know that song. I have become a sign to many. You are my strong refuge. My mouth is filled with your praise, declaring your splendor all day long. As for me, I will always have hope. I will praise you more and more. As for me, I will always have an expectation. I will always have an anticipation of your words being fulfilled in my life and in the life of the church. Therefore, I will praise you more and more until I see those things happening. Praise is a real key. You, you think about it. If you, if you can get to that place of just praising God all day long, troubles just become insignificant. All the issues of life just become insignificant. Because the greatest hope that we have is the hope of the resurrection. And that will not be taken away from us. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It reaches in through the curtain into the inner sanctuary where Jesus, who went before us, has entered on our behalf. So as we, by faith, enter into the presence of God, holding on to Jesus, that becomes like an anchor that is firm and secure. So again, it just affirms that hope is a definite hope. It's a secure hope, something we can put, put our money in the bank on. You know that it's going to happen. Now I understand why Paul says, hey, you're quiet. Why are you so quiet? Pondering. Abraham was the, the father of hope. I'll just read the scripture from Romans chapter 4, 17 to 20. It says, as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations, he is our Father in the sight of God in whom he believed. The God who gives life to the dead and calls things that are not as though they were. Against all hope, Abraham in hope, this is God's hope, that's in certainty and expectation, believed and so became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. 
without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead, yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. Fully persuaded. He believed in the God who gives life to the dead. And you know, in in some of those scriptures, it talks about Isaac, his son, you know how he was asked to sacrifice his son. He really believed that God would be able to raise him back from the dead. That was where, of course, we know that that God then, his intention was that when his son came, he was going to raise him from the dead. I just want to give a... Ian and Dawn, you want to just stand up? What if, what if I said to Ian and Dawn, you're going to have a child in your later years? <laughs> now, see, we all laugh, don't we? And what did Sarah do? She laughed. I mean, you just think, you, you, you're kidding me. Come on, it's, it's way past having a child, you know. Sperm counts down. The <laughs> no eggs being ovulated. Come on, it's impossible. I mean, that's, that's our reaction, isn't it? So, you know, sometimes we look at, you know, biblical situations. If you look at Abraham and we think, oh, well, you know, because it's in the Bible, it's something sort of pretty unique and special, which it is. But let's be real. Abraham and Sarah were the same as us. Well, Sarah, she, she laughed. But Abraham, he believed God. He believed God. What do you reckon, Ian? Having said that, would you have believed me? I mean, it just shows you that for someone at that age to actually believe God to do that, that takes enormous faith. That takes enormous hope that he would fulfill his word. And it says of Abraham, he was fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. God wants to lift our expectations of what he wants to do, what he can do. The disciples were the same like, as us. When Jesus rose from the dead and the women went to the tomb and the angel said, he's gone, he's alive, when they went and told the apostles, they thought they were strange. They didn't, they didn't believe them, that he'd risen from the dead, and yet Jesus had said that he would rise from the dead. We're the same. You know, they're, they're, just, they're just ordinary people filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, they became filled with the Holy Spirit. They were commissioned through Jesus to do miracles, signs, and wonders. Then the day of Pentecost, they got filled with the Holy Spirit. But until that point, they... They didn't believe either. The the guys on the the road to Emmaus, they were downcast. You know, they'd heard about what the women had said, but they were downcast. So they obviously weren't in faith believing that Jesus had risen from the dead, even though there was some witnesses saying he had risen from the dead. But Abraham had that faith. He had faith that the God who gives life to the dead would return his son. He believed that God would give him a son. So he's the father of faith. So no wonder the Bible talks about him being our father of faith. He went before us. Thank God for Abraham. I don't know if I would have, I don't know if any of us here would have had that sort of faith. So thank God he found a man who would have that sort of faith that in hope, in expectation, believed that God would fulfill his word. And so we know with Jesus, that was the most impossible of situations. When he went to the cross, the disciples were just totally perplexed, totally distraught. The one who came to 
to bring the kingdom of heaven, the one who did miracle signs and wonders, was crucified. He was dead. And they didn't believe that he had risen from the dead until he appeared to them. And then their faith rose. And for 40 days, Jesus spoke to them about the kingdom of heaven. And then they waited, I guarantee you, in hope for that day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured out on them. I want to share a testimony that hopefully (laughs) will build your faith to have hope in many areas of your life. Um, If God is wanting to bring this word, I'm sure in all of our lives there are situations where he wants to our faith to rise to another level and to have a hope in different areas that Perhaps we've regressed in or just diminished in, but to restore again a hope in the God who's able to raise the dead in our time. Uh, Most of you are aware that we had some Devastating news in January. Um, Dates are a bit of a blur to me. I think it was the 10th of January. But on the 12th of January, we got news that Heather's sister had suddenly died. She actually took her own life. And it was it was devastating. No warning. We knew that uh, she had some depression, but we just thought she's got a medical background. She's a nurse, or the rest of it. We thought, um, you know, we didn't think that she had sort of gone to those sort of depths of despair. And there's many reasons now that we've you know we've been able to understand more fully, but time just won't allow me to go into all those details but we literally had two days to get our passports in order because they had lapsed and leave on the we heard on the Thursday and we had to leave on Saturday to fly to New Zealand which is where she's been living for the last 10-15 years and um Funeral was going to be on the Monday. Um, so, Anna Michaela came along and Josh came along. Um, when we told Heather's mum, um, who's lived in a nursing home up in Lobethal, she was just totally broken, distraught as you would be, um, because Kathy was in her late 50s, um, and it was just so sudden. The next, so we went and saw her that night. The next morning, um, I was driving up to Lobethal just to comfort her. It's actually it's a good ending, <laughs> even though <laughs> um, I found myself. It's like the Holy Spirit just brought to mind. I don't know if you've heard of the testimony of um, Ian McCormack. 
in New Zealand. You know, this goes about 25 years ago. You can look it up on YouTube. Ian McCormack, he got stung by these boxer jellyfish. Uh, he, he got stung by at least five or more of them. I think it was at Mauritius um, Island where he was, he was diving um, with um, some fellow divers there. And he wasn't a believer. But in the pro, like he had to get himself to hospital and it was limited um, health uh, or, I guess, medical attention on that island. Uh, I think it was a French colony. But he, he knew that he was in the process of dying you know, because apparently the, um, it's lethal to, to have one sting. But he had, he had multiple stings, you know, about half a dozen. And he just felt his life or his body numbing up. And, you know, this is over a process of probably an hour or a couple of hours of his journey to get to the hospital because he'd been diving, had to, had to get some sort of transport, which wasn't easy. Um, but in the process of, like, in his mind, thinking, what on earth's going on? You know, he was facing death. He knew he was facing death. But he's... His mother was a Christian and she knew that he had never really sort of accepted um, Jesus. But she said, she always said to him, you know, if you are in trouble, deep, deep trouble, call out to the Lord and he will save you. So, Again, you can watch it on YouTube and just hear the discourse, you know, the conversation he was having with the Holy Spirit and the words that were coming to him. And that in that, in that process, he, he gave his life to Jesus. He remembered what his mum had said. He went and tried all sorts of different religions, but he realised God was actually speaking to him in the process of dying, that... God will go to any length. If he went to the length of sending his son to die for us, why would he not go to great lengths to rescue us? And every one of us have a testimony how God chased us there. And the short of it is he committed his life to Jesus. He died. He went. He actually went to a dark place first, which is a place of darkness. From that place, a shaft of light drew him out, took him to heaven. He had an encounter with Jesus. And then he had a choice of whether to stay or to come back. He had been out of his body for about an hour. And you know, they were taking him to the morgue. When he actually came to, they were prodding his feet with needles, you know, just to see <laughs> how dead he was. And he came, came to life again. Um, but it was, a, it was a, a place of desperation, you know, in his dying time. And I had, it was like the Holy Spirit was just giving me faith that God is not limited by time. He knows the end from the beginning. He can step into history at any time, whether, whether he go from the beginning to the end and step back again or somewhere in between, and there's, there are many scriptures that actually uh, give a good argument that Elijah and Moses were actually transported from the past, from the mountain where they were encountering God, to the Mount of Transfiguration where Jesus was, and then back again. God can do anything like that. He can step into time at any time. And I found myself just crying out to God for Kathy's life. That's Heather's sister. I just I was crying out. I said, Lord, you, there's no limit in you. I'm praying now for you to do something before she dies. She planned it so meticulously. And I just I found myself saying, you are the God of the impossible. Nothing is impossible to you. That you can step into her life as we pray for her afterwards. 
and do the same as you did with Ian McCormack because the Holy Spirit was the one who was revealing that. He was the one who brought that to mind. It wasn't me that did that. So I just cried out to him and just interceded for her that she would have the same opportunity to know the Lord. And when the funeral came, like we, we were there for Saturday and a bit of Sunday, the family, there's, there's, not, a, there's not an ounce of belief in them of Jesus. Any time that Heather and I witnessed to her sister and husband, um, we could only go so far. We could never go any further. Um, so there was res there was resistance all the way through, and you know our devastation as much as anything was pretty obvious. She doesn't know the Lord, you know, and her destiny, as far as we knew, was hell. So that's why. We prayed so earnestly for her. And their children actually asked Dan to sing a song at the funeral. And get this, the song they chose was Van, Van Morrison, Have I Told You Lately That I Love You. Because <laughs> it was, it was one, one of Kathy's favorites. And if you read that, that, that really is a song to God. You know, there's, I was listening to it this morning, and just, but there were, there were words in it, come on, find your page, <laughs> um, where it says, ease my troubles, that's what you do. And it says, we should give thanks and pray to the one. And, in the order of service, it actually had a place there for um, anyone to say something because we knew that there were uh, sister-in-laws that wanted to speak, Heather wanted to speak, her, sister, her other sister wanted to speak, I wanted to say a few words. And on the morning of the funeral, my heart was just pounding because the, the Holy Spirit bringing a conviction to say something. And as I was sitting in the room where Dan was practicing the song, I, I was just sort of randomly going through scriptures. And when he, started, when he was singing that, but ease my troubles, that's what you do, and we should give thanks and pray. I looked down at my scriptures, and it's the book of James that says, is, if, is there any one of you in trouble, he should pray. I'm looking at it as he's singing it. So we prayed for opportunity for God to break through in the funeral. So when, when Dan sang, that, like, there was not a mention of God right the way through the funeral. When it came to that place, or just before, Dan sang that song. It was like the presence of God just came into that place. There would have been 200 people there. And I remembered that on the photo board, there was one photo there of Kathy in her, at her confirmation as a Lutheran girl in her teens where she had given her life to the Lord. And I believed that what the Holy Spirit was showing was that the prayers had been heard, that she did have opportunity to repent and accept the Lord if you know, if that wasn't enough at the confirmation, because you know, we sometimes get a bit religious and say, yeah, they're not living the life, so obviously they're not believers. But who knows? You know? God is the one who remembers those things. And I stood up and I said, I just want to bring some hope here today. And I explained, I said, there's a picture out there of Kathy on the, the board there where she was confirmed as a Lutheran and said, for those of you who don't, who don't know what that is, I explained what it was, you know, that that's when you give your life to Jesus. And there's more, but, and I said, what she, her 
declaration when she was a teenager to put her trust in Jesus. I believe that God has heard that and that she is in heaven. And I know that God put hope there because of the way things happen and with the song and all the rest of it. There was, like, he, he, he sealed it. He caused it to happen. He gave certainty and hope in that situation. And there are numerous people that are, were friends of them that are actually believers that came up and, and said, man, we are so glad you said that because we thought she was gone. You know? we, we didn't think there was any hope whatsoever for her as far as eternity is concerned. And as, as a result of that, her husband, he has opened up because he wants to see her again. So there, and there's a process that's going on at the moment. He's actually, he has actually had a priest, an Anglican priest, <laughs> like Ian, he, come into the house and actually bless the house. He invited, like, at the recommendation of a friend, said, um, you should have, I'm sure they said, you should have somebody come in and cleanse and blah, blah, you know, like not just bless the house. But that was his understanding, that the house was being blessed. And they felt good that that should be done. And when, it, when he did bless the house, they said they had such a peace um, because she suicided in the house. Um, and they now, each of them, are going to a counsellor who was a pastor, <laughs> who's running a counselling um, house, whatever you call it. But, so there's a process now going on. You know, there's, a, there's a breakthrough. You know, the God of hope has put hope back into our lives and into their family's life. And we, we have an expectancy now. We have a hope that God is going to, finish what he started, that he has saved her and that something is happening in the family that will bring hope to them. It's never too late. And if that word is just that for every one of us, we continue to pray for our family members and our friends that God would break through and bring hope that they would turn to the Lord, whether it be right in their dying days or whether it be in, in the life sort of leading up to that. You know, we, like I said, we all have been through that ourselves. You know, we've all went through a process. It took a long time for us to come to that place. Some of you, it might have been a lot quicker, but we know the process, but there is, there is hope there. There's, there's God's hope, a certainty, an expectation that, there are many situations, not, not just those. But I mean, that's the most devastating, isn't it? That if somebody goes to hell without, without knowing God, like it says in Ephesians, without, without hope and without God, or without God, without hope. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have now been brought near through the blood of Jesus. And we want every one of our family members to have that opportunity to know what Jesus has done for them, and for them to come to that place. So I encourage you in that testimony that there is hope in whatever your situation is. There's hope. I mean, it's just stirred my heart in greater ways now to believe that he's able to break into many people's lives that don't know the Lord and, and have a willingness to open my mouth you know, where he gives opportunity to. He is the God of hope. And if that's in the area of healing, there is a certainty, expectation and a certainty in the words that he's spoken that Jesus took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. Surely he bore our sins on the tree. That we being dead to sin might live to righteousness by whose stripes you are healed knowing the promises of God, knowing the Word of God more than ever, that we can have an expectation that He will fulfill those words, whatever that situation is. For those that Mark felt the Holy Spirit said, the legs and feet, to have that expectation that they'll be restored. Tom, that knee fully, totally, 
I know you've come a long way. You're going to come a lot further. You're going to see a greater measure of healing there. And whatever it is that you're facing, whatever it is that we're all facing, and that we can look at the wisdom of God, look at the Word of God, see what His promises are, and then with faith and expectation, faith and hope, see those things come to pass.